you get what you require. A fundamental law of abundance is that you get what you require. If you tell me you want a bunch of money and I ask you what for, and there's a blank expression on your face, then you really don't know what for and you will likely not get it. The millionaires I've met in person usually have some kind of mission. Either they want to take their company to the next higher version or level, or they want to support a growing family. The funds they require are delivered when they require them. The universe likes to fill voids, and generally you always have the amount of money you actually need or the amount that accords to your plans. If there is nothing and nobody to care for, then you really don't need much money. Another somewhat related prosperity law is don't use credit unless you're doing it to purchase assets. I know a lot of people that break this law, and many financial advisors would strongly disagree with me on this. They go into debt for a car, the house they live in, a vacation, equipment, but how do these things make them any money? They don't. And I'm always puzzled when I see people doing it. They too quickly go into debt for something that will not give a return on investment. If I borrow money to buy a house, I'm going to rent the house to tenants so that the house is making money for me. Life is governed by attractor fields, meaning like attracts like. If you're in debt, it's rather unlikely that you will attract money. That's why it doesn't pay off to have debt. If you're in debt, pay off your debt before you go to buy new clothes for women or gadgets for men. Try to feel new within, independent of external factors. If you can feel like a new person without the new clothes and the new gadget, you won't need them anymore. But then you'll more quickly have the money to actually be able to afford them. Shifting your money vibration. For the forgetful among you, it bears repeating, you cannot attract anything into your life that you do not feel and accept. If you have a money situation, then you have to fundamentally shift your feelings about money. The following focus shift exercise is a good starting point for that. Step 1. Take stock of your outer money situation. Write down all the money you have and all the money you owe every bit of it. So, for example, Tom, $500. Savings, $2,000. Credit card, $1,000. Income, $900. Make a long list, including everything. Don't shy away from doing this. Being afraid of confronting reality as it is will make it difficult for you to change reality. Simply acknowledge what is. Step two, create your inner money situation. Make another list of the same items, but this time write down the amount you would prefer them to be. This trains your attention to focus on what you would like rather than what is lacking. So, for example, owing Tom zero, savings $4,000, credit card zero, income $5,000. Keep it realistic to what would feel right, what would feel good. And don't exaggerate the amounts. In regards to money, this one fairly simple exercise shifts your energy vibration. Consequently, you'll experience something different, something better than had you not done it. Love creates money. There is an abundance of blogs, websites, seminars, and books on money, marketing, how to get rich, how to become a millionaire, etc. But there is no abundance of rich people. Have you noticed that? What logically follows from that is that much of this abundance of information on money and prosperity is false. If it were true, then everyone would be overflowing with the riches promised in the overhyped ads and fake testimonials. One of the key ingredients missing from this plethora of useless information is love. Why is love not mentioned in economic magazines, stock market reports, real estate websites, and become a millionaire books? Because it is associated with something different than money. It is associated with romance, sex, music, and intimacy. Why isn't it taught in school? Because school is neither interested in teaching love nor in teaching prosperity. 
It is only interested in indoctrinating children into the hive mind mentality of collectivism. Why isn't it taught in business classes? Because it is not realized that love is energy, or that the invisible force we call energy actually exists. The first key to riches is to love yourself. If you love, respect, and honor yourself, treat yourself with care, respect, and approval, you stop the desperate, frenzied, and hassled chasing after the world's goods. When you stop chasing energy, energy starts chasing you. The second key to riches is to love others. All they ever wanted is some love. And once you love them, you will receive more gifts, money, and attention than you can even cope with. There are many other keys to being rich, but if you develop and expand on this one, the other keys will become apparent. Affluent versus non-affluent spending. Statistical research has shown that the non-wealthy spend more on food, housing, utilities, and transportation, whereas the wealthy spend more on education, clothing, and retirement funds. This makes perfect metaphysical sense considering that wealth is attracted by mind, education, beingness, of which external appearance and clothing is a part, and sense of inner security, hence saving for retirement. On the other hand, a purely survival and fear-driven attitude would be to put too much focus on food and housing. Here's a quote from M. Taniguchi. Wealth, in the first place, does not simply mean a condition in which there is a large amount of matter. To be wealthy means one has a large amount of something with which to do work that would benefit others. That which works to benefit others is love. And when we put love into practice, it becomes wealth. Your job as a work of art. No matter what your job or profession is, never devalue what you do by talking badly about it. One of the great mystical secrets of life is the way that you do one thing is the way you do everything. This means that you can learn the lessons of life in any job. You can experience any job in different negative or positive versions. If you're an ice cream seller, you can do it in a manner that is joyous to yourself and the children buying from you, or you can do it as a grumpy person who is dissatisfied with their position. The mystical key being given to you here is that a job is not about what you get out of it. It is about what you put into it. Ask not what your job can do for you. Ask what you can do for your job. As a human being, you want to create, produce, contribute, and elevate your craft to its highest version possible. This means that even as a trash collector, you can perform the job with grace and focus or carelessly and frustrated. It's not about the external. It's all about the internal. If you've been wanting to be promoted in your company for years but haven't, and you're frustrated by that, then it's time to let go of wanting to be promoted and do the job that you have more impeccably. You thus create an energy field that makes it much more likely to be promoted. By your personal effort, any work can be elevated to an art form, and it is a joy for humanity to enter a well-run company, a well-run shoe shop, or to see a well-run website. It provides inspiration for them, and they learn from your example. The quickest path to success is not to yearn for another job, but to do your present job the best you can. You have then surrendered your resistance and returned to the stream of life, which carries you to better places more quickly. Be mindful about your work. Your work is co-creation at its best. Bad-mouthing one's job has become a mass epidemic, but you don't have to participate in that losing strategy. Play the cards you are dealt well, and you'll get better cards.